Go ahead and turn in or turn on your Bibles to James. We looked at it last week, James chapter 1. We've been in James this new series. It's a summer series where we're walking through an entire book of the New Testament. And, uh, and it's called Contrast. We talked about really the contra- contrast of works and grace. And, uh, and then last week we talked about uh, just this idea of contrasting blessings and suffering. And uh, really, I guess you could say this week is part two of last week's message in many ways because that text just continues to expound on this whole idea of celebration and suffering, which sounds so uh, contrary or or paradoxical. And so I understand it's really hard for us to, to, in our our human uh, finite thinking, to grab a hold of how we can possibly celebrate in the midst of suffering. But that's what we're going to continue to talk about today in this whole idea of not, uh, no it's not, but yes he is. No it's not, but yes he is. James chapter 1, just to remind you, verse 2, here's what it says. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Again, reminding us that we should be able to find joy even in the midst of suffering. But today we're going to look at verse 12 through verse 18. And so go ahead and turn in uh, your Bibles, James chapter 1, verse 12. And here's what it says beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Now, understand that, again, tells us God has not just led us to the trial, but he's leading us through the trial. So we're persevering under trial because having stood to the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And that that, uh, language is so strong and it helps us understand. We truly are dragged away by our own desires and enticed. Then after desires conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Look at verse uh, 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. It's important to see that, that it is from the truth, the source of our new birth is from the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Again, building on last week's whole idea of celebration and suffering, we want to kind of uh, unpack verses 12 through 18 in the same manner, looking at this idea, beginning with the idea that no, it's not all good. Man, not, there's not anybody in this room who has a perfect life. We kind of spent the entire uh, week last week talking about that. Uh, today we're going to talk about the character of God in uh, relationship to our imperfect world, but man, we've got to start again reminding ourselves that, man, it's not all good. Sometimes we may say that. We catch people in the, in the hall or the parking lot or whatever, and with, how are you doing? Oh, man, it's all good. You know, everything's great. Everything's going well. Uh, circumstances are fine. Sometimes we're even not truthful about that. You know, things may not be very good. There may be times that uh, we just don't want to share kind of what's, what's happening in our life that is unpleasing, the experience or the circumstances that we're facing. Uh, bad things do happen, but uh, even beyond that, bad things do happen to good people. We all face bad things, regardless of how godly of a person you are. You can even go as far as to say that oftentimes bad things can happen even more often in some good people's lives. Uh, I've had social media discussions recently to this end where people are just kind of asking questions. We're talking back and forth about just this whole idea. Many times we have to, we have to, as God's people, even see that some people who are bent against God seem to be uh, blessed more than people who uh, do please God. And that seems so confusing. That's conflicting. How can that be the case? Why does God allow some people to succeed who are not pleasing to him and then other people who really serve him faithfully uh, somehow don't get the same blessings? That doesn't seem fair. It is kind of a part of our existence as, as a believer. We have to understand that God doesn't promise us all good things. And, and man, it's so important. It's gonna, we'll dive into it deeper because it's such a, a cultural misunderstanding in our day. Our, our evangelical doctrine in North America is so polluted by this kind of philosophy. 
Uh, but it's not all good. Bad things do happen, and bad things do happen to good people. Matthew 5, 45 says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so good things happen to good and bad people, and bad things happen to good and bad people. Uh, we can rest assured that, uh, that he's not a respecter of persons in that regard. Now, this is such a misunderstood concept, again, in North American uh, churches. Uh, our nation is subtly bought into this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, and it's, it's really permeated into even Bible-believing, solid, conservative theology uh, in our churches, because here's what's happened. Uh, we may think that we're beyond the effect of it, and, and we may think, hey, there's no way that we're guilty of this, but most Christians get confused uh, in this way. Most believers believe that God will, uh, God's will for them is only blessing. I would even say, probably more so, God's will for them is mostly blessing uh, and never struggle. But if we look at Scripture, e even if we look at the examples of people in the Bible not speculating what we think God would do, but really looking at people who followed Jesus, people who actually loved God, you know, what happened in their lives, it was not always good. In fact, a lot of the, the stories in the Bible are of how his people suffered, how his people struggled. Now, sometimes those struggles were because of their decisions, right? Mistakes they made. Other times it was not decisions they made. There, there were times where other people's decisions caused them strife and struggle and so it's, it's not true to say that if you follow God, everything's going to work out fine in, in your circumstances in this earth. There are going to be, there are going to be times in this, uh, your existence here on earth when things don't go perfectly, where things are, are troublesome, where things are, are not uh, what you expected. You're going to be surprised by some circumstances. You're not always going to get the job, right? You're not going to always uh, make the grade. You're not going to always... Uh, get, get what you expect or, or get paid what you think you should. And you can pray earnestly. You, man, you can really pray believing. Some people say, well, if you have enough faith that God is going to give you, if you name it, you'll you claim it, God will give it. And that's such, a, such a, a heretical philosophy. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that God does bless us. And I don't want anybody to leave here thinking, well, man, God's got it out for me. Just, you know, if I follow Jesus, it's going to be a terrible life. That's not the case at all. But it's, it's, it's also irresponsible for us to teach people that all they're going to experience as a Christ follower is blessing. That's just not true. That, that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Uh, but make no mistake, He is a God of blessing. Scripture does teach us that we can depend on His provision. Let me give you two scriptures that give us this example. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, this obviously is a letter that John's writing. In this letter, he's, he's, it's the greeting. It's the first, actually, first uh, two verses of the first chapter of 3 John. And so he's basically offering a greeting, like if I wrote you an email, right? And in the email, I say, hey, man, uh, just want you to know, uh, as I start, it's great to see. I hope everything's going well. I'm praying for you that God would really bless you. That's the same kind of thing. It's a greeting. It's an opening greeting in a letter. And so even though it's true, we do believe that God will bless and prosper those who follow him. We also know that that doesn't mean exhaustively, if you follow Jesus, that everything's going to be prosperous, that everything's going to be great as we walk through this life. There are going to be bad days. Another one's Jeremiah 29, 11, that uh, I think we, man, we, we see these, like people have posters and, and uh, if you ever go to like Gatlinburg, there, there's like some engraved wood carvings with it. You know, you find you one with Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Here's what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, I read that in the NIV, which is our pew Bibles. We have pew Bibles in here with the New International Version. And I, I've never been aware of this until this week when I studied other translations uh, of this verse. Do you know the NIV is the one that, that says the word prosper? And it's interesting. I've never seen it on a poster where it didn't use the word prosper. And even in my memorization, I remember as a child memorizing the verse, and I actually remember memorizing it with the word prosper in it. But ironically, I, didn't, I wasn't raised using the NIV every week. 
And, and so where did we get that? I really do believe this. I believe that it was like a preferential thing culturally again. We like the way the NIV said it better. And so most people use the NIV for this scripture because it used the word prosper. But here's what's important to see. Even in the scripture, Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, if you go back to the Hebrew language, that's what the Old Testament's written in. The Hebrew language there, the word prosper is the word shalom. And we, might, we don't have to be Bible scholars. Listen to this. If you know the definition of the word shalom, say it now. Peace, right? Yeah, like 20 people knew that. All right, that's true. It's great. Here's, shalom is like a very common thing. I mean, people say it all the time when they're leaving and greeting one another. Shalom, there's this peace. And, and this is a way, this is a, a clear, now can it mean prosper? Yes, it also can mean prosper. But it's very clear that in the text... Yeah, the translations, even if you look at the ESV, some of you may look at the ESV, it's, it's uh, translated welfare. In the NLT, the New Living Translation, it's translated good. Uh, and in the New King James Version, it's translated peace. And so the whole idea is here that, that it's God's desire to give us good things, for sure, to be good to us, to, to love us, and to care for us, to bring peace in the midst of uh, confusion and, and complication, but it doesn't mean that God's going to make you rich, right? It doesn't mean necessarily that God's going to always answer your prayer monetarily to pay the bills, to do this and that. Now, can we trust Him for provision? Absolutely. Without a doubt, we can trust Him. But understand, it's not that God has given us this, this card that we have an endless supply of just to, just to do what He's going to do whatever we ask Him to do. That's not the way blessing works. Our lives are also filled with complication. Our lives are filled with trouble. And you may say, well, preacher, why is this so important? Here's why it's important. I feel like if we teach errantly that somehow if you serve God, everything's going to be perfect, and if you're faithful to Him, that you're never going to have trouble, then what happens is we all inevitably face trouble, right? And we all inevitably have trouble, trial, tribulation, difficulty, struggle. And when we face that, we think God has done us wrong. Because our doctrine or our theology has not been based on Scripture. It's been based on what we want God to be. And so because we think God is always just going to bless, 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 never have struggle, never face a complication or be confronted with a challenge in our life, then that, that means that when, when it happens and we're confronted by it, many people bail. They bail on church altogether. Like it going gets tough and the tough stay home. <laughs> On Sunday, you know, and sometimes we see this happen in our lives where when we get in the difficult time, instead of clinging to the people who could love them the most, many people just check out. And they say, well, man, my expectation of what God was going to do, because I read the book that told me my best life was now and that if I prayed it and believed it enough, it was going to be given to me. And, and, and now God's not doing what I thought he was going to do. And so if God's not going to just do what I thought he was going to do, if, if he's not meeting my expectation, then I'm going to bail when times get hard. But if we understand that it's not based on that, it's not a circumstantial faith. It's not a faith that's conditional on what God does for us. But our faith in Him is based on who He is. So that's a completely different thing. And that is truly a biblical view of Christianity. It's not all good. This life is not all good. Man, and look, let me just go and tell you. If you're, maybe you're getting ready to get married, or you know, you're preparing, you're dating somebody. Let me just go and say... They're not as good as you think they are. Amen, you know? <laughs> now, I'm one of the rare ones that it, she gets better every day. Amen, you know? But all of us, all of us have to have a, like when we date and when we, we you know, uh, preparing for marriage, it, it's like we, we don't know each other's flaws. But man, look, the truth of the matter is, it, it's, not, it's not all good. Marriage is tough. Parenting... Oh, when you're holding that newborn baby, you're just thinking, this is the best moment of our life, right? Guess what? It's not all good. you got to change diapers, man, seriously. You know what I'm saying? It's not all good. Uh, there's going to be some projectile problems coming into play. I'm telling you, it's not all good. It's, it's not all easy. And then when, they, when our kids get older, it's challenging. I mean, it's hard. Because kids think parents don't know what they're talking about and, and parents try to convince the children to do the right thing. It is not easy. It's not all good. It's not all good. And, and, and I'm just telling you, your job, you may think that job's perfect and, and when you get it, eventually, something's going to happen. And it's not going to be all good. Why is that? Because the life we live is filled with disappointment. It just is part of our lives. And it doesn't mean God has let us down. 
It means this world has let us down. All right? So uh, we have to grab onto that first, that we understand it's not all good. Bad things are going to happen to good people. But here's the, the thing we've got to cling to. God's people still trust Him anyway. Even in the midst of disappointment, even when bad things happen, we trust God. Uh, one thing's for certain, God's never to blame for our problems, right? He's not to blame. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the story there? They were standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, and, uh, and they were being threatened. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar said, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace uh, if you don't bow down. Did, did uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down? No. They said first, they said, we, first of all, believe that God is going to deliver us. We believe this. We have faith that God is going to deliver us. In other words, they were saying in the context of our discussion, we believe God is going to bless us, all right? We believe God is going to make a way in this situation. He is going to provide for us. We believe this. But even if he does not, we are not going to bail on him. We're not going to check out on him. We are going to be faithful. We're going to trust him, even in the midst of this burning fire, that we can feel the fire on our faces, we are not going to quit on God. See, that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. Not that they were running from the fire, they faced the fire in faith. And in the same way, we could say, God, we're trusting you. We believe that you are going to bless us. We believe that you're going to provide. We believe that you're going to heal. I'm in this sickness and I'm facing this surgery. God, we're believing that you're going to heal. But even if you don't, even if you don't do what we think you should do, by faith, by faith we're facing the fire, right? We're, we're going to, to continue to trust you no matter what we face. Man, that's such an imperative understanding for us as Christians in this modern day because our culture is not teaching that. Our church culture in North America is not teaching that kind of faith. Now, one thing is certain, though, God is never to blame for our for our problems. James 1 13, look what it says in verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own desires and enticed. Notice that we drag ourselves away by our own desires. Let me introduce you to something. This is sin in a bag. Amen? I don't know if you've I don't know if you've ever heard of caramel M&M's. I'm not even an M&M fan. I don't, I don't necessarily, if you could, if you had M&M's and you said, hey man, you want one? I would say, no thank you. All right? This is not a temptation for me. Peanut M&M's? A little bit. All right? A little bit. Pretzel M&M's? No. Almond M&M's? Okay. Maybe a little bit. You throw the word caramel in there, forget it. All right? This is a temptation. But, but here's the thing I want you to see. It says, sharing size. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, when this breaks open, I ain't sharing with nobody. I'm telling you. These are addictive, man. It's really, honestly, it's, it's, it's like modern day, it's like the new crack cocaine. I'm serious. This, this is addictive. It's addictive. And here's the thing. No matter what, I, though part of me says, I want to say, thank you, Jesus. This is a gift from God, right? Part of me wants to say that. I know this, though I should thank God for the goodness of caramel M&M's. I cannot blame him when I eat every one of them, all right? Because this is my decision, my personal decision to eat all of them and not share them with you. That's my decision. And it is my own sinful desires that lead me to do that. All right, now I'm going to take them away so you aren't tempted for the rest of the service. Amen? But this is what happens in our lives. It's not all about peanut M&M's, right? It's not all about caramel M&M's. It really is all about our desires. We are led astray, and when we're led astray, we're not led astray by, by God. God doesn't lead us astray. God doesn't... Here's the thing. Sometimes He puts something good in front of us. He does give us a blessing. He gives us something to enjoy, and we so mess it up. Our desires mess up something good that God has done. God gives us good stuff. And we can't just be satisfied with his goodness. We can't share his goodness with everyone. We've got to have it all for ourselves. And what happens is then something that God intended for good becomes sin in our lives. And God is not to blame for that. 
Let me give you real life, this confrontational stuff, all right, I know. But money, all right? God gives us money. We have provisions and we make money. And, and, and God does bless us. He does. If we're faithful, he opens up the windows of heaven, pours out on us such a blessing that we can't contain it. But what happens is sometimes God gives us something good, and that which is good, somehow we, we become so gluttonous and so self-centered that all we think about is what we can do with what God has given to us that is good. How can we enjoy the goodness of God? How can we serve ourselves with it? And then what God has intended for good in our life actually becomes sin because we're not faithful stewards of that goodness. Man, it applies in every area of our life, but here's the point. God is not to blame for our sin. God is never to blame. Look, look, God is not the one who leads us astray. Years ago, man, some of you older people would understand or remember this, Flip Wilson. I don't even remember him on TV, all right? But I do remember the quote. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Truth of the matter is, that was a lie. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. When you sin, you choose to sin. You make a mistake. You actually make an intentional decision to go the other direction that God is not leading you to go. And I do the same thing. And so it's not all good. But here's the second thing that we've got to see real quickly. God is all good. Even in the midst of a, a, a world that's filled with brokenness, in the midst of circumstances that surround us that are not good. These are bad circumstances. We're living in a world that's filled with bad things. But God is all good. God is completely good. We've said this many ways, many times, but here's the truth. God is not just a doer of good things. He's not just an example of goodness. He embodies goodness. He actually defines goodness. God is good. And so he's not just the doer of good things. He is defined uh, by goodness. Romans 8.28 tells us that even as he's working in our lives, he is working even in the bad things. We know that all things God works or is working for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so even when it's tough, we've got to remember that God is working. God is actively working in your life. God is moving mountains. But look, the truth of the matter is it doesn't mean that you're not going to have trouble. It doesn't mean that you're not struggling. There are going to be times where it's difficult. But God even uses the difficulty to make us uh, better and stronger in the, in the work of, of his kingdom. So God is never responsible for our sin, but he is also never leaves us hopeless in our sin. He helps us and strengthens us to be able to overcome it. Let me uh, give you a Piper quote. John Piper said, We embrace the hand we've been dealt because we know the dealer, and he never deals badly. I think that's so powerful if we can just really grab a hold of that and say, you know what? Our hand may not be the hand we wish we had, but I'm still going to embrace the hand that I've been dealt because I know this, God's the one who dealt it. God is the dealer, and, and I trust him, and he never deals badly, even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of pain, even if I don't like everything that I'm, the hand that I'm holding, I can know this, I trust him, and I know that he's working even in the midst of this difficult experience. So here's the bottom line. No, it's not all good, but he is all good all the time. God is all good all the time. So God is all good, but he is always good. God is always good. Look at verse 17 in James 1. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. Notice that what it said. It said he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And, and, and when we think about this, this shadow, there's no shadow of turning or there's no shifting shadows. Uh, every night we know the sun goes down uh, literally, the earth rotates, and when the earth rotates, the sun disappears, and the absence of light from the sun means we're actually living in the shadow, right? We're living in the shadow of the sun, and so that is what we call night. And so really, every night, the sun goes down, and we sleep in a huge shadow. Now, we do all know this because of scary movies and everything else. I mean, it makes us very aware that darkness oftentimes breeds fear. There's this tie together that we think when it's dark, it's, we, sometimes we'll just get afraid. That's why we like a nightlight, right? We, we, can't, we like to have light. And, and at the same time, we know that uh, it's uncertainty. Sometimes we're uncertain 
uh, in the midst of shadows. If, if you were walking down the street and there was a dark alley, you know, you would not necessarily want to go into the shadows of the alley because it's uncertain. It's uncertain what you would find and what your fate would be. And so this is obvious. We, we understand what we're talking about when we talk about the shifting shadows. It's uncertainty. But here's what we can know about God. God is certain. In fact, well, here's the key. In the midst of an ever-changing world, we, we serve a never-changing God. And so even in the midst of shifting shadows, we serve the light, Jesus Christ, right? We know that he is the same, Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And 1 Corinthians 14, 33 reminds us he's not the author of confusion, but peace. And so he is the one who's constantly speaking peace in the midst of the shadows, in the midst of uncertainty. He is bringing comfort and peace. Even though he doesn't just lead us to, he leads us through those valleys and the shadows and the difficulties. Here's the thing. It doesn't mean he's going to make us not go through them. But as we walk through them, he is speaking peace to our, our chaos. He is continually comforting us in our pain. He is continually loving us and shining light on our path in the midst of the darkness. And we can trust him. We can trust him. But if we look at that passage one last time, this is such... Uh, the important part that if, if we didn't watch it, we'd just skip over it. In James 1.18, it says, He brought us forth by the word of truth. Now, in the midst of uncertainty, and here's uh, getting away from this whole idea of struggle and trouble, but, but even uh, in, a, in a similar uh, conversation, our culture is filled with confusion. And the darkness of our culture, the shifting shadows of our, the context of North America and uh, uh, spirituality and really what's expected of people of faith in our nation. This is so important that we see James 1.18 saying, He brought us forth by the word of truth. And basically what this is saying is that if, if, if it were not for truth, if it were not for the truth of the gospel, which truly the word euangelion, the gospel, is, is truly the good news. If it were not for the good news of the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we would not have been brought out of sin into salvation, right? We'd still be stuck in the pit of despair. So it's the hope of the gospel, the good news, the word of truth by which God has saved us. But this is so important because, man, every day you can turn on the news and see example after example. This last week, I think it's important enough, I won't even speak to this, but if you haven't seen the clip, I want to show you a clip of Bernie Sanders this last week. Let me preface it by saying this. This is in no way a political endorsement or uh, pushing anybody else away. I'm, I'm not going to ever stand and say, vote Democrat or vote Republican or never will I ever endorse a candidate. But when someone says something that is blatantly against God's word, I am going to be faithful before the Lord, no matter what, to, to uh, tell you uh, a clear biblical view of what is said. And so uh, let me go ahead and just play this clip. Uh, watch it with me if you would. Yes. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America. I really don't know. Probably a couple of million. Are you suggesting that all of those people stand condemned? What about Jews? They stand condemned too. Senator, I'm a Christian. I, I understand you are a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion, but there are other people who have different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that, that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. And do you think your statement that you put into that publication, they do not know God because they've rejected Jesus Christ the Son and they stand condemned, do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator... I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ and salvation. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. 
Biblethone Mellon. Senator Gregory. Now, I only play that for you because, uh, again, it doesn't matter what political party that it would be from, my position would be the same. Here's the reality. No matter, no matter who is talking to anybody, I don't even know anything about the nominee. I saw budget committee. I'm thankful that our budget committee is not that way in the church. I mean, that's, whoo, that's pretty confrontational, right? But, uh, but here's, what, here, here's the truth. In, in, in any conversation of the public arena, because the whole conversation here is should a true believer in Jesus be allowed to serve in public office? The senator's opinion is no. That someone who actually has the audacity to believe that the words of Jesus are true when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And let me say again, this is important. I mean, we're talking about the foundational uh, orthodox Christian belief for the last 2,000 years. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no man can come to the Father except through Him. And so if, 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 this, if it's, we're not allowed to believe that, then what it means is that that truth we're talking about, the word of truth from James 1.18... It's saying that we have to remove that completely from what we believe if we're going to step into the public square. And here's what I would say. We should defend. Now, some people would, would not like this. Let me just tell you. You've got to be consistent. We should be able to defend the right of a Muslim to sit on a, a committee or serve public office and not compromise his convictions. If he wants to serve, he should believe the faith that he believes. We, we adamantly believe that he is wrong. We believe the truth of God's word. But here's the deal. We can't just because we want to be uh, elected or serve or be accepted by a culture that's confused and shifting in the shadows and turning away. We cannot turn away from the truth of God's word. We will not. We must not compromise the truth. Without the truth, we're not Christians. Without the truth, we have turned away from everything that we believe. And so a person who denies that Jesus is the only answer to man's sin problem is not a follower of Jesus. And so this is so important. And, and even that, that example, this last week, it was so in our face, it was so present on the screen, shared among social media. It's so important that we deal with it, we not run from it. Because that is a, that is a religious test. And you shouldn't have a religious test for public service. You should never discriminate against someone because they do or don't believe one thing or another. Uh, you should, as a Christian, not feel compelled to twist or run away from your belief in Jesus Christ. Bernie Sanders is not right in that position. And I do not believe he's the voice of the Founding Fathers in regards to our religious liberty. His position is anti-Christian. And we are free to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. What does that have to do with James 1.18? Man, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He brought us forth by the word of truth. Here's what that means. We have to love people in truth. And here's the deal. It's the gospel. It's the good news. The good news is this word of truth is for everyone. God desires for everyone to come to him by grace. And so with that in mind, he is, it amplifies this idea, he is a good God. Man, it's not all good. Our world is filled with trouble. Our world is filled with people turning away from him. Our culture is bent against him. But even in the midst of trouble, God is good. God is all good. Go a step further, God is always all good. And we can trust him even when everyone else turns against us. Man, if today were the day and you were standing at the fiery furnace, right? If you were standing at the budget committee, right? Well, what would be your response, man? What would be your response? Would you bail? Would you check out? Would you fold? Or would you have a real faith in Jesus Christ? See, that's where it's going to come uh, to a reality. That's when you actually, you know, when your circumstances change, when trouble does come, is your faith really in Jesus? I mean, have you, have you truly trusted him as your savior? That's more important than anything else you're going to face. And I'd say today, look, if you heard nothing else today, man, today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, if you say today, man, I don't know if I'm a follower of Jesus, that, that's more important than anything else. 
place your faith in Him. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You don't have to wait until tomorrow or next week. You don't have to wait until youth camp. Man, you could trust Him today. And I pray you'll do that. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth, for truth. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that we celebrate Him. And we do not have to be ashamed of Him. I thank you for a church that believes in Jesus, not just in religious practice or ceremony, but we want to follow our Savior. And so today, God, I pray that you'd give us strength. And if someone's here today and they need to make that decision to follow you, Lord, give them, give them the courage to step out in just a moment to come forward. I pray you give them the strength to, uh, to act and, and obey. We pray in Jesus' name. As we continue to bow, let me just uh, give you a challenge. There are going to be ministers down front here. And as we sing, we're going to have a song where we're all singing together. But if you need to make that decision to come to Jesus, you just come, find one of these ministers down front and take them by the hand and just say, I'm ready to make that decision. I want to follow Jesus. Let that be the day. Let this be the day that you make that decision. Let's stand together as we sing.